Welcome to this WiseOwl tutorial on event handling and logging in SQL Server integration services. Here's what we'll learn on the tutorial. We'll begin by having a look at event handling within integration services. So we'll look at how to create event handlers, how to review the ones you've already got set up, and how to get variables to raise events when their values change. We'll then go on to look at logging. So we'll look at the main types of logging available to you, how to log information on a package's execution progress to text files, and how to do the same thing to a SQL Server table. And finally, we'll have a quick look at audit transforms, which provide another way to log information about what's going on within your package. So let's get started. To illustrate the concept of event handlers and how to make them work within integration services, I've created a really simple package, which imports from an Excel worksheet the number of series, imports a number of mentors and stores those two bits of information in variables called number mentors and number series. What the script then does is display the result of those two variables. If I run this package you'll see that it comes up with a dialog box saying I've imported nine series and ten mentors. The precise details of how these two data flow tasks work isn't terribly important but just for the sake of your curiosity I'll show you one of them. It takes in an Excel worksheet and uses a row count transform to store the number of rows in a variable. It works, but you could argue that this uh, script task isn't actually part of the control flow at all. It's just almost like a debug message which is popping up on screen to say that everything's worked successfully. This would be even truer if I had used something like a send mail task, in which case I really would just be reporting on the progress of what's happening without it necessarily being part of my control flow. So what I'm going to do is show you an alternative way to achieve the same thing using an event handler and then we can decide whether or not it's better. To do that I'll just cut that to my clipboard. clipboard. I'm going to need it soon and I'll connect these two tasks up together so they run in sequence. What I want to do is say that when this get number of mentors task has finished executing then I want my message to appear. So what I'm going to do is go to the event handlers tab and click on the drop arrow on the left hand side and choose to which task or which package I want to attach an event. Now because I have the get number of mentors selected it's chosen that automatically but I could attach an event to any one of these different parts of my package. So I'll choose that. I can then choose the event and the three main ones you'll choose typically which are pre-execute which runs immediately before the task runs post-execute runs immediately after it has finished executing and on error is fairly self-explanatory. So I'm going to choose post-execute and I now need to click to create my post-execute event handler. If you're expecting something dramatic to happen at this point you'll be disappointed. All it does is clear the screen. I've got an event handler. You can see that because it's gone bold in my list but it's not actually doing anything. So what I'll do is paste in my script task there and if I now go back to my control flow, you'll see that when I run this um, package, when I finished executing this second task, my event handler will kick in and display exactly the same dialog box as we saw earlier. So let's see if this works. I run my package, it's finished executing the second task, and lo and behold, my event handler has displayed the dialog box. As to whether it's better or not, I'll leave that up to you. Personally, I think it's much clearer if I have everything in my control flow and I don't like the fact that something's hidden away in an event handler, but you may disagree. In the previous part of this tutorial, I created an event handler for the get number of mentors tasks post execute event. What I want to do now is see how you can see to which, which event handlers you've created for which part of a package. One way to do that, of course, is to click in the Event Handlers tab and then click on the part of the package you're interested in. So if you're clairvoyant or have a bit of an insight, you could guess that you've attached something to the Get Number of Mentors task. And when you choose OK, you'll see that your suspicions were correct because it appears in bold in the list. The on post execute event appears in bold in the list. You can then click on that and see what that event is doing. What would be nice though is to have some holistic approach where you can see everything in one place and it's called Package Explorer. And you can see there that you can expand um, the executables, which are essentially the tasks within a package, to see the events attached to each of them. 
If we look at the get number of series task, it's got no event handlers attached to it. But if we look at the get number of mentors task, you can see it has got event handlers attached. In fact, the only events are attached to the on post execute event, and you can expand that to see what the event handlers are. It's a bit disturbing to see that the event handlers have themselves potential to have event handlers. I don't even want to go there. So that's how you can use Package Explorer to review the events you've attached to different parts of a package. So far we've got normal event handlers working. What I want to do now is show that you can get SIS to react to when a variable values has changed. But I should warn you, it's quite complicated and there's so many things which can go wrong that you might want not to bother doing it. Let's have a look at our package we've got. I've got a variable called answer which holds the value 0 initially. And I've got an expression task which changes the value of the variable to 42, which is the meaning of life as we all know. I've then got a script which displays the value of that variable. So if I run this package, what I'll get is a message saying the meaning of life is 42. So far so good. What I want to do now is get the script to run when the value of this variable called answer changes. And that should be fairly straightforward. I should be able to cut this script, go to my event handlers, and attach it to the on variable value changed of the meaning of life task. If I click on that, it will create the event, and I can paste in my script, and surely that's job done. Let's find out. If I run this package now, you'll see that absolutely nothing happens. No script runs. And the reason for that is because my variable isn't telling the world its value has been changed, because by default variables don't. So what I need to do is find a column in here saying whether the value of the variable being changed will raise an event. And I can do that by going to the grid options and choosing to display the raise event when variable value changes column, obviously. The default for that is false, so I'm going to change it to true. And the variable's value changing should now raise an event which should be handled, and I should see my message, shouldn't I? But if I run it, I think we'll see still nothing happens. The problem now is that the scope of the variable is for the entire package, but it's trying to raise an event within a specific task. So what I need to do is to click on the move variable icon and move my variable within the task. The variable disconcertingly vanishes, but that's because I haven't got my task selected. Once I do that, you can see that it reselects it or redisplays it. The really nasty bug is it resets this raise change uh, property back to false which I must admit took me a long time to notice. So I need to change it back to true, otherwise the variable's value being changed won't raise an event. And surely, surely, now it's all going to work. Well, sort of. It's clearly running an event, but what it's not doing is displaying the script. And at this point, I'm going to go to guesswork. I think what's happening is this. I think, for some reason, a script within an event handler raised from this particular type of event can't pass in the variable into it. So what I'm going to do is delete the variable, edit the script, and cheat. So instead of displaying a message giving the value of the variable, what I'm actually going to do is comment that out and instead just display that the meaning of life is 42. And I think if I now run this the variable value changed will raise an event and display that message. And that's how you can get a, the value of a variable being changed to raise an event. I've created an extremely complicated package. It sets a variable to 1 and then displays the value of the variable. And if I run this package, you can see I get an error, uh, sorry, a dialog box saying the value of the variable is 1. That was English sarcasm, by the way, if you were wondering. What I now want to do is to log what's going on so I can look at a, a trace from the uh, executing the package and track down any errors. There's a couple of ways I could do this, a couple of obvious ways. One is to create a text file. That's the sort of thing I might get as a result, so give me lots and lots of information about what's going on. And an alternative idea might be to use SQL Server. So I've got here the output from logging, 
and you can see I've already accumulated 852 rows of all sorts of useful information. The advantage of SQL Server is of course that I can then write queries against it. Here are the types of logging available. You can invoke logging, as I'll show shortly, by choosing SSIS from the menu and choosing logging. The logging providers you can use are, you can send information to a text file, you can send it to a predetermined SQL Server table, and I'll show you how to do that shortly. You can use SQL Server Profiler, and what that does is produce a SQL Profiler trace file about which I know virtually nothing, I'll be honest. You can send information to the Windows event log, and what it will do is log it under the source name SQLIS package 110. Or you can send it to an XML file. I'm going to show the first two. So what we'll do now is set up logging to send information to a text file. To log to a text file, the first thing to do is go to SSIS and choose logging. What I can then do is choose which sort of provider I want, in this case it's a text file one, and add that into the list of providers. Before I can use it I need to configure it, so I need to choose a file connection. But because I don't have one set up for this project package, I'm going to have to create a new one. I'm going to choose an existing file, I'm not going to create one, although I could. And I'm going to browse to my file called log.txt and use that. So I'm sending information to that file. But at the moment I'm not actually logging anything, so what I need to do is choose which bits of the package I'm going to log information for, whether it's the entire package, whether it's the individual tasks within it, or whether it's a combination of both, as here. It still won't work because I now need to choose to tick the logging provider which I've created so that it actually uses it. And then I could do with going into the details tab to fine tune exactly what's going on. At the moment it's not capturing information for any of these events. What I want to do is after every task or and the package itself completes, I want to capture the information from the on post execute event, so I'll tick that. And I could, if I like, go into much more detail on the advanced tab and choose which bits of information I want to capture. So for example, if I don't want the operator, I could just untick that. You can never accuse SSIS of not giving you enough logging information. What I could do if I wanted is save that as an XML file so that I could then retrieve it later on for a different package. But I'm happy with what I've done and what I'm going to do is choose OK and then run it. And what it will do is run marginally more slowly because it's actually writing out text information to that file called log.txt which I'm actually going to ask you to believe. So I can stop running and what I'll do now is show you how to log to SQL Server. The way you log to a SQL Server is almost identical to the way you log to a text file. The first thing to do is choose SSIS from the menu and choose logging and then choose the type of provider you want to use, in this case it's SQL Server. I need to add that into my list of providers and probably at this point untick the text one and choose to use SQL Server instead, although there's nothing to stop me using both. I can choose here the scope of what I want to log. I'm just going to log information for the package rather than also for the individual tasks within it. And I need to configure my SQL Server log provider to say which database is going to. So I've got a connection to the XFactor database and I'll use that. I can then go into details and specify which events I'm going to log information for. I'll choose both on post execute and on pre execute. And I'll click on the advanced button and choose the fact I actually don't again want to log the operator. I'm not quite sure why, but I don't like it. I can then choose OK to confirm that and run my package. And again, it will run marginally more slowly because not only is it doing what the package does, it's also writing information out to a SQL Server table. As to where that table is, let's have a look. In Object Explorer, you've got your database called XFactor, and within that you've got tables, and within those you have system tables. And what SSIS will automatically do is create a new table called SysSSISLog and put your logging information in that. And if you have a look at that table, you can see that it's got all sorts of wonderful information in there um, to be investigated and researched. And that's how you log information to SQL Server. In addition to all the other ways of logging in integration services, such as using logging itself and using events, you can also use a nifty little transform called the Audit Transform. 
and this final part of the tutorial explains how this works. I've got a package which imports some Excel con uh, contestants and uses a UniNull uh, transform to display the information and I've got a data viewer which is going to show what's going down that pipeline. And you can see there's 109 rows and you can see it's put in the columns coming from the Excel workbook. There's about six of them. What I'm now going to do is firstly to stop debugging and I'll get rid of this pipe and what I'm going to do is put in an audit transform between the two. I'll connect all that up so the information flows from the Excel workbook into the audit transform and from there into the union all transform. But what the audit transform will do when I configure it is add in additional columns. I'm going to choose to display the name of the package and I'm going to call that package name, the default. And I'm also going to choose to display the name of the task and I'm going to call that name of task just to prove that I don't have to stick with the preset names. And there's all sorts of other information I could choose to display at the same time. If I now put a data viewer on this final stage, when I run this I'll have two additional columns of information available to me. I'll have, yes, the columns from the original Excel workbook, but scrolling across to the right I've also got the package name and the name of the task. At this point I probably could have chosen more useful information because they're always the same. And that's what an audit transform lets you do and that completes this tutorial on logging and event handling in integration services. We hope you've enjoyed this tutorial on event handling and logging in SQL Server integration services. There's loads more training resources on SQL Server, .NET, Microsoft Office and all sorts of other software applications at www.wiseowl.co.uk.